Kia ora koutou. welcome to this month's hot take. Um, this is part of Fair Trade Fortnight, which is super exciting to be um, kind of partnering with them on this event. And we thought we'd bring together some of the awesome businesses in our network who have been repping for Fair Trade for a long time. So really excited to hear those presentations. Um, thank you all for joining today. Uh, if you haven't joined a hot take before, how we run this is we have our presentations sort of the first half usually about 10 minutes each, um, and there will be lots of time for Q&A afterwards. So while we're having the presenters speak, um, you're welcome to have your cameras off and videos off and everything. And then once we jump into the Q&A, um, it's great if we can get a bit of a conversation going. So then we ask you to pop your camera on and ask any questions you have out loud. Um, but if you have any burning questions pop up while um, our presenters are speaking, feel free to pop them in the chat and then I can get to them when we launch into the Q&A part. But thank you all for joining us today. So we're saying um, how fair is fair trade and how do we look at this issue and, and kind of discuss it from a business sense, it from a consumer sense. And I hope today we'll do a really good um, sort of overview. So our first speaker is Sent Hill from Fairtrade New Zealand um, and Australia. So he's going to give us a bit of an a overview of Fairtrade. Then we're going to go to the Kōkākō team um, and hear from Mike and Kaz, which will be super exciting about how it's worked for their business. And then we're going to finish up with Simon from All Good. Um, so some really yeah excellent examples of fair trade in practice. So um, I'll just keep admitting people in the background, but without further ado, I'll pass over to you, Sinhal. Thank you, Ayla. You see my screen? Yes, looks beautiful. Excellent. Um, it was 1864, about 150 years back now. Um, what you're seeing here is, is a small island called Auckland Island. Um, if you don't know where is Auckland Island, that's about some 300 miles down south of New Zealand, where most of you are from. Um, two ships were passing that island, exploratory ships full of their crew. Um, and because of bad weather, you know, these ships got into wreck. Um, the thing here is, you know, both of them, both of the survivors in the ship were on the island at the same time. Uh, one ship, which is on the other end of the island, is Invercall, and the other ship is called Grafton, which is on this side, the other end you see. Um, and they have been, the, the survivors have been trying to live there for about a year uh, without knowing to each other. So one sh the survivors of one ship don't know there is another group that's trying to survive in the same island. Um, the reason I'm taking the story is, you know, shipwrecks are a fascinating natural experiments for human behavior. You know, if you, if you study social science, you know, these kind of experiments are rare, but gives a very good explanation about human behavior. Um, after struggling to survive for an year, um, almost all the crew of Invercall were perished. There were just two people who were just in their bone and skin managed to survive. But all crew members of Grafton survived. Um, you know, of course, they faced their challenges, but they survived. Um, so what happened between these you know, two ships? Same island, same condition. One group survived and the other group perished. The findings were fascinating. You know, if I could summarize the finding in the simple line, the philosophy of Invercall survivors you know, among the people who, the sailors, is one should look after for themselves, that's it. The, the overarching goal there is, you know, you don't worry about what other person is going through. All you have to do and fight for is your own survival. And the diary records show that people even uh, resorted to cannibalism, eat, eating one another for survival. Uh, but the overarching theme of Grafton survivors is collective spirit. You, even if their diaries show, they have a very strong code of conduct about, you know, how to behave you know, if they get a small catch in the sea, how should they share the food? You know, they have a very clearly laid out codes. And, you know, eventually that saved them when a rescue ship reached the Zotland Island after a year. The, the reason I wanted to start my presentation with the story is whenever I think of the story, it reminds me of the world we live in today, right? You know, um, economists predict that there are 
three things which which clearly indicate and you know upcoming social unrest or you know challenges for humanity one is rising temperature massive climate change second is rising cost of food and the third is decreased public spending you know cut back on public spending if these three happens at the same time if you look back history these are very strong predictors of impending social unrest and it's very unfortunate that as we speak today these three things are brewing in one part of the world or other some of us may be aware of it some of us may not be but it's happening around the world so the question is who should solve these problems people look up to someone right we all are individuals and we look up to some leaders or you know some some kind of movement to come and save humanity or you know to to at least to preserve our future if you think back on this question there are two entities you could think about uh, or strong contender first is governments second is businesses governments are great they have great power but the problem for government is you know, they have they have a lot of regulatory power but the problem is you know they are not very swift in execution they have to get a lot of consensus they don't have much time to test something iterate something and learn from it right they, they are not nimble not because they don't want to because the way government function it's a very different you know working model so who else is left to save us it's businesses right um so people look up to businesses uh, to solve some of the problems you know it, it, and, and it's absolutely right but from my experience working with businesses in sustainability and i also worked in the the commercial side of the businesses for a decade um i clearly realized that how businesses behave today will have a pivotal role in defining our our future you know it could be cutting back on emissions it could be being fair and just to the supply chain partners but the thing is not all businesses fall in the same you know matrix or quadrant so i would define the entire businesses into a few classifications the first is there are businesses they don't care why right? they whatever happens in the world poverty climate change doesn't matter for them their their priority is you know making profit and you know passing it back to the shareholders or owner that's one set of business then there is another set of business uh, this group is they act like they care you know often you read about greenwashing stories right companies which say like yeah we did this but it turned out to be just a balloon um so these these businesses fall into this category you know they really don't want to do something but in order to maintain their image they just present to the world or take some namesake measures to show the world that yeah they care then the other group of businesses they care you know they are absolutely concerned about the challenges they you know the 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 challenges the world faces but they really don't know what to do you know they they don't have the answers or they don't know what actions to take and the last category these are businesses they care and they act you know so they are absolutely concerned about it and you know they are the pioneers they go and just break the rules and do something which is both good for their businesses and good for the society now the question is how do you identify which business fall into what category now it's a complex question okay you know scholars spend their careers to identify the good businesses versus bad businesses but from my experience working with businesses there is one single indicator which which help you identify which business falls into which category which is the extent they share their power or resources with marginalized and vulnerable it could be you know sharing back their profit or it could be sharing their market power if you see a business which is doing this that's one of the clear predictors of where the business falls in, falls into now you may ask a question where does fair trade fits into the scheme of things we work with these two set of businesses you know we work with businesses that they care about the sustainability issues and act and we also work with businesses they care but they don't know how to act that's where fair trade fits in uh now some may ask you know why don't you work with don't care act like they care we cannot you know they need to have self realization to fall into this quadrant to partner with fair trade and fair trade comes with cost you know some of the businesses like kokako or um all good they they'll present up to me being fair trade is not just a easy thing it it costs money for them 
um, you know, they have to just flow back some of the profits they are generating to the communities. So you cannot just speak doing good, you know, by having a fair trade mark. It comes with a lot of responsibility. And we work with that businesses, so challenging it is. Now, let me quickly explain you what is fair trade. So for which you have to first understand how the trade functions, right? Let's assume that trade, the value chains are very complicated and hard to cover in 10 minutes, but let's keep three important actors in any value chain, in any food and beverage value chain at least. There is consumers and businesses, consumer go to businesses and buy products, and businesses go to, say in this case, smallholder farmers who produce, say, coffee or cocoa or sugar, and the, the good seamlessly flows in between, you know, these three actors. Of course, there are intermediaries in between. Now, the way the goods or services are exchanged between three actors defines the difference between conventional trade and fat trade. So what I did was I pulled up a few variables and I wanted to present to this group, what's the difference between conventional trade and fair trade. Uh, so if you look at the strategy of an organization, in conventional trade, their overriding concern is profit. Whereas for fair trade, yes, they do care about profit, but they balance the concern for people and planet. If you look at the supply chains, in conventional trade, their ultimate goal is to go and find out wherever you get the cheapest product, cheapest labor, cheapest law material, raw materials. And th there is little concern for producers, families, or workers in the supply chain. But in fair trade, uh, our partners work with supply chain, treat supply chain as their partners, particularly disadvantaged groups, as I said, by paying a minimum price and premium. That's what differentiates fair trade. In marketing, if you look at conventional trade, marketing is directed at increasing profitability. The ultimate goal is you know, make consumers buy more and more so the top line grows and the company can make more profit. Whereas in fat trade, it's a much more complicated thing. You've got to educate consumers. You've got to educate civil society. You've got to educate suppliers. You've got to educate partners. It's not just marketing going out and you know, speaking to your consumers about your product. So it's a much more complicated thing. So this basically, you know, some of the, the, the key dimensions that helps you to differentiate between a conventional trade and fair trade. Let me just tell you a small example here before I hand over to Mike, um, or it's a story. In fair trade, we thrive on stories, right? We work with farmers and communities, it's, it's all stories. Now, what you're seeing here looks like a grass, right? Um, so this grass is called kunai grass. This is grown in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Um, farmers or you know, the communities we work with for generations or for centuries, they used to cut this grass to make the thatched roof in their house, right? They, they build houses out of it. But for the past few years, the producers are seeing that you know, this grass is no longer growing the, in their surrounding. So for an outsider, it may look like just grass, but for them, it is, it is something which is essential for their living, right? So this grass is no longer growing. You know, they don't know the reason. Some say it's because of, you know, the weather patterns, which is not suitable for this grass. You know, that is some of the weed type of grass, which is growing much faster, that is not helping these communities. Some say that is some pest or disease incidents that basically just wiping away this grass. Now, the reason I wanted to share this you know, story is because we work with community in these communities, fat trade empowered these producers or the businesses who work with these producers flowed back this premium and the minimum price, which communities are investing behind building their own houses you know, because they are no longer getting this grass. Imagine an outsider going and just seeing or doing a development intervention. It would have been much more different then you pass it on this power to the communities to decide what they want for themselves. At Fat Trade, we do that exactly. You know, we shift the balance of power from those who have it in abundance to those who need it. Now, you should remember that Fat Trade is a voluntary standard, right? I often get into conversations with licensees who say, look, you know, we cannot pay this. You know, this is expensive. This is what X, Y, Z, you know? So, we are easily replaceable, honestly. If a business wants to say that, no, we don't want to go with it, there are thousands of greenwashing label out there and which consumers hardly differentiates what is fair trade, what's organic, what is blah, blah, blah. You know, businesses can survive without us. 
But I often question myself and I often question my team that, you know, which I'll sum up by quoting this from the Bible, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Uh, and I think this applies to businesses as well. Over to you, Mike. Thanks very much, Sentil. That was a pretty uh, awesome intro into fair trade. And I suppose it gives us um, a really good overview to kick off. Um, set. Sorry, everyone. Did someone have their hand up to ask a question or? I can't see anybody. I think you guys are good to go. Oh, yeah. you've got, we've just got some clapping going on. Oh, cool, cool. <laughs> Actually, apologies. Um, just need to, we're just trying to get this working because it's actually. No worries. Maybe it's the one above. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. We did <laughs> we did practice this. Um, so Kaz, you drive and I'll start talking. I'm gonna start talking. So um thank you everyone. There's a lot of um faces and, and names that I can see on the screen there of people that are joining us today, and we really appreciate that. Um we've been going since um we've been going for 22 years, and in that time um uh, we've learned a lot about fair trade. Here we go. Um, and it was 2009 that we actually first um, decided that we would become certified. So um, I purchased the business in 2007. Um, and in 2009, we decided that it wasn't good enough just to be organic. We needed to think about um, all parts of the supply chain. We needed to think about who, who those actors in the supply chain were, the environment and the social side as well. Um, and so yes, soil health and being organic is really important, but we've got to think about, well, who are the people that are actually tending the soil and picking the coffee beans? 2009 is when we, um, we kicked off our certification and we're really proud now that um, we're triple certified. So we're certified organic with BioGrow, certified fair trade, uh, and we're also um, certified climate neutral. Um, so yes, as Central alluded to, there's um, quite a bit of cost that comes with that. Um, and um, maybe I'll get to that soon and Simon will probably talk to you a little bit about that as well. Um, so there's me in Papua New Guinea. Um, my first trip to PNG was uh, 10 years ago um, and it was a real awakening and and I suppose um, Kaz, my colleague who's sitting next to me is our trainer and um, account manager who's just got back from Papua New Guinea but Kaz is going to talk a little bit more in depth about what that means and, and why we go to Papua New Guinea but for me personally it was recognizing that we have a true connection with the people who um, are very imperative in our supply chain and they are doing all that hard mahi um, to ensure that every morning we get to enjoy a beautiful cup of coffee. So um, it's really that connection that we have with the producers that's part of that fair trade story and our ability to articulate that story to all the stakeholders, whether it's business owners, consumers, is, is super important for us. The fair trade mark is also really important to us as well because it's a third party verification, um, which means that it's not us putting our hand up and saying, hey, buy this coffee, it's fair trade. It's actually, it's a global mark and it's 50% owned by producers, which means that the producers actually have a say in, um, democratic say in how the fair trade premiums are spent. Um, and we're gonna show you a few examples of that um, this morning, or this afternoon, sorry. Quality and training is also a really, really big part of why we're affiliated with fair trade. So, Yes, there's the fair trade minimum price, and that's recently gone up, and you may have seen some recent media um, about that. Um, but it's also the quality aspect that's really important to us. So as a specialty coffee roaster, we're out there and we're competing with the big names in coffee, 
And we've got to make sure that apart from being an ethical coffee, that our quality is exceptional. So the quality and the training aspect of fair trade has um, become really meaningful to us. Both Kaz and I have participated in a lot of those trainings um, over in PNG. So we've really um, been able to ensure that that supply chain is robust and that any issues at um, origin are able to be captured and addressed so that everyone in New Zealand gets a great cup of coffee. And there's social and environmental part as well. Um, so um, rather than thinking of coffee as a commodity and we're just ordering it um, and we're roasting it and we're sending it out, it's really that social connection and understanding everything from soil health to biodiversity and permaculture um, rather than looking at coffee as a, as a monoculture, it's actually looking at it um, as a product that um, for us, especially in Papua New Guinea, is shade grown um, and there's other um, companion plantings that actually enhance the quality of the coffee as well. So I'm going to hand over to Kaz um, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay. Hi everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Kaz. I am the barista trainer at Pukaku and um, I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to go to Papua New Guinea um, just in June there, like literally a couple of months ago. So um, it's kind of nice and fresh and a good sort of timing for me to be able to like chat to you about, you know, how fair trade benefits, you know, Papua New Guinea and how much better off they are from having that partnership together so I can see it sort of firsthand and really see the difference, difference it makes for them. Um, so I was just going to kind of run through a wee bit of that. There's so much to kind of talk about, so um, sort of run through it um, sort of quickly. But if you want to know any more information about it, we have like a, a blog on our website that has so much info that you can have a look at. Um, but yeah, so let's kick it off. So, so yeah, basically, just um, with, you know, being a Papua New Guinea, um, I sort of learned that every origin is different and the way they kind of process and different processes that they go through. Um, so we kind of learned all about that from start to finish um, and, and got to see kind of the different projects that they're working on in the future as well. Um, so, yeah, so I might just flick on to this one. So basically... The different kind of the one thing I kind of learned from when I, when going to Papua New Guinea was how quite unevolved they are with the different processes and stages that they go through. Um, sort of compared to other sort of countries that maybe have bigger machineries and things like that. So a couple of examples would be like them they hand pick every single cherry. Um, and compared to other countries, they maybe use harvesters and things like that. Um, and also the, this here on the screen is a pulper. So that removes the, the um, bean from the cherry and that they were only introduced about five years ago. Um, and there's still some villages that don't have them, but it's um, made a massive difference for them because five years ago, they were using a stone to actually remove the cherry, which can damage the beans as well. So this is something that Fairtrade has introduced. So it's a massive difference for them. Um, also washing the coffee, like they, they do have some water stations, but they some people literally take them down to the river and wash the the beans so you can see how kind of how sort of uninvolved that is and how much more they need um and, and plus another thing is like they they walk long distances to get to the side of the road to like kind of deliver their beans um so all all these things is like crucial but um there's things as well like um when they lie the the beans out to dry um fair trade have introduced these raised drying beds that that make the process last a bit um quicker so um there's lots of different things that they're they're trying to introduce to make things better for them um and then one thing as well i thought was really cool was um the the communities there are amazing and they all like work together to sort of support each other and um like try and grow with each other. So um, there's this, you can see here, it's, um, they do beekeeping. So they're trying to introduce new ways to like get more income and things like that. And, and also every year they have that annual um, general meeting and they all discuss what things that um, would be benefit them for their communities and um, with the premium that they get. So they're all trying to help each other, which is really cool. 
And then, yeah, one thing that's really um, important and that was so good that we got the chance to go there was the quality control side of things. So um, many people that many of the farmers that um, live in Papua New Guinea don't actually drink the coffee. So they're like brewing this coffee and they're not actually getting to taste the end result. So um, it was amazing that we got to go there and let them taste their amazing coffee and give them that reassurance of how great they're doing um, and to keep it up sort of thing. So it was, it was good for them to hear that from us. This is why the, these trips are so important um, because one... One um, Daniel Kene, he's like the chairman sort of for HUAC. And he kind of mentioned that us being there was not just for the coffee, but more than that, it brought like communities together. Um, there had been some conflict and things, but by us being there, it brought them together and allowed them to see that they're not just in the kind of, well, he quoted this, but in the darkness, like lost. Like we're actually, we put a face to the bean kind of thing. And we, you know, it gives them that motivation to like work, keep going, keep doing what they're doing really. Um, so yeah, like that's, the, it's the, all about the people really. Like as what Daniel said, you know, we give them that boost um, by going there. And they, the people there are just absolutely amazing. They're so kind and generous and they're so happy and it just, yeah, it was just the most amazing place to be and to meet them people. Um, so yeah, like, and just, just to see the benefits of and how they're growing was just really, really cool. So, but yeah, there's there's so much more I could talk about. Um, but yeah, definitely have we read at the, the blog and our website if you want more in detail or if you have any questions or anything, I'm happy to sort of answer. But yeah, that's kind of a little gist about what happened. <laughs> Thank you for Kako team. That was great. And yeah, um, we'll make sure to share that uh, blog post in the follow-up email with you all so you can have a further read. But yes, please think of any questions you have um, for the next bit. But before that, I'll pass over to Simon to finish up the presentation part of today. Thanks, Ayla. Um, let me just present. Can everyone see that? Yep, looks awesome. Thanks, Simon. Great. Um, really appreciate the chance to talk to you all. And thanks, Centella, Mike, and Kaz. I think what you're saying, Kaz, about people being the kind of most compelling reason for doing this rings true with me. The most fun I have or have had and am continuing to have with the two companies I'm involved with, All Good and Karma Drinks, is visiting farmers. and there are a number of stories I'd really love to tell you all about the relationship we have with them and what that's taught me beyond the commerce of the business. But I think Mike and Kaz have very admirably traversed those stories. I think it might be more beneficial to you all for me to talk about our customers and how fair trade has enabled us to basically stay in business for the last 13 or 14 years. Um, all Good began supplying New Zealanders with fair trade and organically ground bana grown bananas about 13 years ago. Um, we, Chris Morrison, who's, whom some of you know, um, his brother Matt and I started the business to do the right thing. Um, and that became our mantra to be able to produce food and drink that would be good for the land, good for growers and good for our customers. Everything we do as a company and as the company we've spun off is rooted in these values and environmental health, social justice, and the individual freedom of the people that produce our materials and ingredients um, are kind of the values that contribute to our, to our bottom line. So we believe that without these, we really don't have a distinctive way of differentiating ourselves in two very competitive marketplaces. Bananas, and there's a reason we have fair trade bananas. I won't go into that in great detail, but there's also a reason a lot of banana growing countries are called banana republics or a lot of South American countries that have been um, thwarted by the politics of large fruit companies are called banana republics. And it's not much to do with the people that have voted for the government. 
those countries. It's a lot to do with with really having them with well-being of these people. And fair trade have done a remarkable job of giving them economic independence. We've taken advantage of that. And in the history of our uh, briefly, brief history, just over 10 years, um, we've introduced fair trade bananas to New Zealanders. Um, we started selling them in 2010. And we've grown our market share to about 40, 400,000 bunches of bananas sold every month, which is between four and five containers a week. So there's something in selling a product that is better than its competition. But with a banana, it's not that obvious um, why something, why our banana is better. The strength of our brand reputation has enabled to, us to create this brand. Um, and some belief in our customers and spin off another business, Karma Drinks. To build an ethical business like All Good, all three of our finding values, founding values, this idea of environmental and social justice, um, need to contribute to our commercial success. And the only measure we have of that is profit, is sales with enough margin to give us profit, which is always a struggle for us because we're competing with a lot less margin than most of our competitors. Um, and to do that, to be true to these beliefs, the products need to command a premium. So we have to sell a bunch of bananas for a dollar more than conventional ones in the same place as you buy conventional ones. We have to sell soft drinks in cafes for about one to two dollars more and in supermarkets for a couple of dollars more. So we're really trying, you know, to convince someone to spend a lot more on something that's essentially the same product. There's nothing we can do to compete that, that someone else can't do to compete on quality of the experience and flavor and possibly the, you know, the amount of awareness there is around those brands. All we can do is our, that, that sort of third value, which is the doing good, that if we, well, the third way we do this, there's a sort of haiku we use for both businesses that in order for us to be able to really engage a customer and sell one of these products, they have to look great. So the bananas have to be the right color, not spotty, look very attractive. Um, they have to taste great because if they don't, no one's going to buy another bunch. Uh, but they have to do, do great things, do good. And it's the do good that di differentiates us. And this is where fair trade comes in because we can't do that in a conventional way. We can't do that by buying advertising space because we just don't have the budget for it. But we can do it by telling stories. And arguably, these stories need to be better than the people we're competing with. They need to be about things that our customers believe in because brands are essentially beliefs. Um, they're not really about credentials or logos and packaging. They're about what people believe you're doing for them or what will make them feel better about the purchase they're making. So convince people that our products are worth more, we need them to believe that they're better. And to do this, we need to tell a better story. And in our case, being an ethical business is that better story. And that's underpinned by us having a fair trade license and being able to make connections, the ones you've seen that Kaz and Mike have been talking about between producers and consumers. And my personal view of this is if you can, if you can bring that relationship together, everything you buy from a supermarket, which is pretty much the territory we compete on, has been produced by someone. And someone benefits from the purchase you're making. What we want is for consumers to know that there's a person in El Guabo in Ecuador and their family who've benefited from you buying that, that bunch of bananas in a way that's very tangible. So to do that, we try and tell these stories in the media. We try and leverage what we know we've got that we have as a sort of unique asset, these stories, um, to kind of zig where others would zag. So, Another way I think about it is that if we want to be in the press for, you know, telling a story about here, Wilson Sanchez, who has a, a farm in the Andes, it's probably one of the highest altitude banana farms we buy from, 
He actually has to get his bananas to come down the hill on the back of a donkey. Um, it's quite laborious. But with the help of Fair Trade, we brought Wilson to New Zealand to meet all the produce managers that are responsible for buying these, these bananas of Wilson's um, across a whole lot of New World supermarkets around the country. That connection made a huge difference because after those produce managers who are basically the customer we're selling to in this case, met Wilson, it was very hard for them not to buy a banana. They knew his story. They knew that they were supporting his daughter, Kelly, who came with him, who's now graduated from university thanks to the number of bananas that New Zealand has bought from New World and from us. And those sorts of stories last, you know, beyond being in the newspaper or being heard or being presented to by a, a visit like the ones we did with Fair Trade, the Fair Trade Organization here and, and Wilson. They are memorable because they're personal connection. We also have a group of fans in Boma Village in, in Sierra Leone. This is them here. Now, unfortunately, the man I want to talk to you about who's dressed as Santa here isn't with us anymore. His name is Chief Hindu Kamara. He's been the biggest advocate of Karma Cola in the world, really, and our kind of poster child for, for what we do. Because we purchase cola from this community, we've been able to send about 700 young women to school, build bridges, help them become economically independent. And they have a, a thing there when, you know, one of the brands we like to think we compete against sort of own Christmas come up with a big Father Christmas on the back of a truck every year. And um, although it was probably a bit controversial at the time, I thought I'd take a Santa suit along and put it on Hindua so that he could dress up as Father Christmas and be our poster child. So he did. And he sang us a song. And the song goes, Happy Christmas, We Know Dyer, which means it's kind of fatalistic, but it kind of means we're still here. It's pidgin in English for you know, we're grateful for having got through another year. I thought it would make a great Christmas carol, but unfortunately I couldn't convince anyone else to show it. I do have a video of this that I'm happy to send you a link to. But the thing that I found exciting about this was just the amount of energy and enthusiasm and love they have for us as a company, which makes me feel very good. And for this idea that what they're doing in a very remote part of the world is having an impact on consumers in places they may never visit and find it very hard to comprehend. Big cities like London, Paris, and here. Um, that connection's really what makes the brand work, that it transcends the kind of, dare I say it, the superficiality of a soft drink. They're not really essential commodities. and turns them into an experience that people can really have a personal part of, because hopefully they know that they've made this impact. And there's a hundred more of these stories. This couple grow our ginger in Sri Lanka. Um, they uh, they live in in the hill um, in the rainforest just near Kandy in the center 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 of Sri Lanka, and uh, they um, they produce a fair trade and organically certified ginger root that we use in our product, Gingerella. Um, I guess the point of all this is that it doesn't cost a lot to do that. If you can tell your story in a way that is memorable to a few people, they'll carry it for you. Things that I learned, still have a tea towel that published, which has the, their supply chain on it as a little map all the way from the bed to the cafe. And we've done a few of these educate or allow them to be used to educate kids around where their bananas come from. And once they know that, they're more likely to educate their parents as well. So having ways of telling true stories rather than kind of marketing hype to an audience that's really interested in learning these things, in our case, you know, nine-year-olds who I think the kids are from point 
Um, who are open to get through to them, they'll pester their parents and their parents will spend a dollar more on that bunch of bananas. Uh, one of the things I guess we should end on is that we, it's, it's not easy to do this, but the adversity, the sort of challenges we have is a kind of a great university. It helps us to keep the scorecard of what we do. And this is another thing I've learned from Mike and Kaz from the crew at Pukaka. They produce an extraordinary impact report every year. It is a labor of love. It's probably the most impressive document in this world that you could look at in terms of a small enterprising ethical business showing their, their stakeholders, their values on their sleeve. And, you know, we've sort of copied that and tried to give ourselves a report pretty frequently around the things that we stand for. And this came about also because years ago, when we first started to promote our bananas, the Fair Trade Organization were gracious enough to bring Harriet Lamb, who was then the CEO, over to New Zealand. And she, on, on a public stage, said to a whole group of people that she didn't have to trust us, which I took offense to. I thought it was a pretty you know, not the most flattering thing to say about the people who brought her out to New Zealand, but she was right. She said, the Fair Trade Foundation and the licensing organization have a set of rules that mean we don't have to trust it, anyone. We've got to meet these criteria. And if you do, you get the label. And that's where third party certification is really important, that you have this rigor. And that if you are going to tell these sorts of stories, they're true. And that, really different chapter because as Sintel was saying earlier there's lots of people that can make these claims but unless you can substantiate them it's pretty easy these days to find out whether or not someone's telling the truth thanks uh, if anyone would like to hear more of those stories i can send a bunch of links so maybe you could throw your email addresses or contact details in the chat and i'll be able to grab them all and, and, and send out an email with a bunch of things you could look at. But I won't hog any more time. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Simon. That was great. And yeah, we can um, include any links um, and send them out to everybody. Um, yeah, really interesting and great from all of our presenters today, giving quite different views on what fair trade can mean for businesses. And I think the idea of those tangible stories and those stories that make the customer have a connection to the product are really important. And um, I do quite a lot of presentations to businesses who are kind of just starting out on sustainability. And a lot of the data I use for them is around how smart consumers are getting and how important it is to be doing this stuff and doing it right because they are much more um, time investing into looking into your business and seeing if it aligns with their values and their shopping based on those values so yeah it was really um, really interesting to hear that and how tangible that is for businesses so we can go to some um, Q&A now does anybody have a question to kick us off with Okay. Have a think. Feel free to pop your camera on um, and ask a question out loud. Um, we also have. Um, I wanted to ask a question to you, Sent Hill, from your presentation around how often is a business um, reassessed to check that they're still aligning with those fair trade standards? Yeah, so we have a very standard audit protocols from end to end in the value chain. It's usually once every two or three years. Uh, but in case if we foresee some suspicion or risk, it could be more. Uh, but yeah, it's reassessed in two to three year cycles. Yeah, great, thank you. And um, following on from that, is a business itself certified or is it different products become certified? Mm, great question. So we don't certify businesses. It's just purely the product. So a business may have 10 SKUs. SKUs are the products or shelf keeping units, it's a lingo. Um, you know, they can have nine, which is non-fat rate and can have one, which is fat rate. And they can make their entire line fat rate. But yeah, it's more, more uh, product-centric than business-centric. 
great thanks i actually asked that question because i don't know if anyone else remembers this but quite a few years ago there was a big push in new zealand around whitakers versus um cadbury and there was a huge boycott of cadbury for using palm oil and um not being fair trade and things and i remember writing to whitakers and asking them about it as a I don't know, young teenager, um, and asking them why only some of their chocolate was certified and not the flavor that I wanted. And I remember them explaining that some of the flavors that had lots and lots of different ingredients, it became trickier and trickier because they had to go through the process for all the different ingredients. So they were in the process, but um, yeah, that's why only some of them had started, which I found really interesting and was one of my lead-ins to learning about fair trade. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you did. I think you should write more of such emails to businesses. It helps. Um, look, I, I was reading through a, a, a latest research from a leading consulting group. Um, they said that 80% of the consumers are concerned or you know, want sustainability, but only 5% are willing to pay a premium for that. Um, and you cannot build a sustainable business model without paying money, right? Which is different from what you put in um, for that change. Um, so the biggest power in any free market economy is consumer power. So if people like you go and ask businesses, even it could be a simple email or asking them, why don't you make your sustainable fat rate? You won't believe the kind of impact that makes. It, it'll go a long way. Yeah, most definitely. That is um, one of my, I get asked all the time, what's your like number one sustainability tip, which everyone knows is a bit of a loaded question because it can go many, many different ways. But one of the things I say to people is the more you can talk about it and especially ask brands about it, um, the more impact you can have uh, as you kind of, yeah, unless you're the consumer banging on that door, where's it coming from? It can't just be us sustainability focused people within organizations who are kind of ringing the bell. If consumers can do it too, it's a really um, yeah, impactful way to, with low effort, have a good impact. Cool. Anyone from the audience have any questions for our uh, presenters? Oh, yes, please go, Maria. Hey, sorry. Um, thank you so much to Simon, Mike, and Kaz for that uh, for that presentation, and also Bentel. Um, I actually wanted to speak to a theme that I noticed in especially, uh, well, actually all the presentations, but in Mike, Kaz, and Simon's is the role of community in fair trade. And I was hoping if you could expand a little bit more on uh, how it's played a role in each of your organizations and sort of also building the sustainability of your organizations over time. Thank you. Thanks, feel free to jump in, Simon or Mike. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'll just quickly start with, um, I suppose we wanna build community both here in New Zealand and we wanna build community um, with the producers that we work with. And something that we're really proud of is that We've got with uh, HOAC, Highlands Organic Agriculture Co-op, that we're working with in PNG, where CAS was in June. We've now um, developed a, a relationship with three generations of coffee farmers. So um, Papa Kine, who's now sadly passed away a few years ago, um, his son Daniel, who we've hosted here in New Zealand, and then his nephew Mitchell, um, who we've also hosted here in New Zealand. And so what we're trying to do is build a community of people who actually um, we've invited as many people as we can whenever we've had events in New Zealand so that um, anyone in the community can actually get to understand where their coffee has come from and ask questions of those producers. So I suppose um, that's one example from our perspective. I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, and for me, it was just more seeing how, how people there are, are like a community in Papua New Guinea that like, you know, there was no competition together or anything like that. They as a community and build and grow each other and, and boost each other. And I just thought that was amazing with the, the bee um, pollination. They're trying to think of more ways for their farmer farmers to get more income. And they're just, so I thought that was amazing to see. Um, you know, that side of things. 
Um, and I think, yeah, just, just being able to go there and, and meet the people and build them relationships just makes you care more as well about, you know, when you come home, you don't take a single thing for granted anymore. Like you just, you see how much care goes into it. And then for me, then I can pass that on in my trainings. And, you know, so it's just that communication down the line. Um as you say, talking and yeah, just keep talking and spreading the word really. And Great. sorry, I actually yeah. just wanted to say one thing um, to Kokako, to Mike and Kaz. Um, I've seen the blog posts and the reels on Instagram and all that stuff from the trip to PNG. I really enjoyed the content um, and it's been, you can tell the authenticity that comes from it. It's it the stories that you share through your blog posts are really touching and I think that also sort of comes across to consumers which is really great well, that's good to know sorry Simon I cut you no that's right I think um you know we have three distinct audiences if you like that are the community that we really want to bring together there's our producers um there's our customers who we're selling our products to pretty much cafes and supermarkets and then there's our fans, we hope, our consumers. And creating that I set sense of fandom is pretty important to me because it means we get other people telling our story. I think, you know, what we're trying to do is, is, try, is what we're talking about, I was talking about earlier, is, is bring them as close together as possible so they feel a kind of responsibility for each other. We know our producers are very interested in what's going on in the markets we sell the products in. And like, has explained very rarely do producers in the sorts of rural communities we work with ever get to taste their own product or know what it's like at the other end of the supply chain so the more we can kind of bring that together the, the kind of the more interesting it gets for consumers i think because then they become advocates for us because they know there's a, a real benefit from it there's also a bit of magic that happens, I think, that when people recognize that they've probably done something more than they expected to do from just purchasing a consumer good, there's a little bit of a help as high that happens. There's some serotonin release that we hope you know makes you feel better than just the drink or the banana. Yeah, most definitely. I've loved that. Um, as a consumer of both those products, definitely resonates with me that you you know, you can make, I think when you're trying to be sustainable and, and living with those values, um, it's really nice because sometimes it's quite hard and, and the things that you have to do almost make your life more complicated in ways or um, it can sometimes be things that are taken away. So it's really nice that you can buy something that's just a great product and is that kind of win-win-win Um that you talked about, Simon. I love that little haiku you guys kind of work by. Um, so it's great to it, yeah, it, be able it, to support. It's a real challenge for me because the other enjoyment I get out of the work is the is pretty much doing the coloring in. I really like doing design stuff and the creative side of the business. And that, you know, being able to engage people in a way that isn't kind of preaching to them is, is really hard in this context. Because we are going, you know, we've just reduced our bananas carbon footprint by another 20 grams. You know, actually, not many, not many people either listen to that or remember it. We're interested in it. We believe in it. It's more important to us than it is to anyone else. So I have to keep that top of mind that I've actually got to engage people for a different reason. And that's that this makes them feel better. And not always the things that we that underpin why we're doing it. Are as, as are, are as interesting to the people we're trying to engage as they are to mm -hmm. us. So, you know, having a light touch, making sure, not tricking people, just saying, you know, this should be fun. This is why that taste good idea is really important. If it's not a great product, no one's going to be interested. So you've really got yeah. to delight from our perspective, their kind of eyeballs and then their taste buds before you have permission to do anything else. I think you really see this happening with, Kokako's work because the, the quality of the experience and the care that's taken into not just providing a product but training baristas making sure people know how to how to prepare and present it in the optimal way the best way possible is critical 
And and the great thing is the story gives people the energy to want to do more. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I find you guys must find with your um staff, and it was so evident, Kaz, when you were speaking, how much purpose and kind of drive those stories that back up your products must give the people who work for your companies as well. Yeah, it gives you that, like that confidence that you know the information. I feel like, you know, you can get a lot of information with videos and books and things, but just being out there and being able to like get my experience and be able to like pass that on with confidence now, be able to talk about it open and freely. Um, it's just great. It's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Great to um, align your personal values with your work values. Hey, and, and yeah. yeah, that confidence which fair trade really guarantees with that third party certification is just unmatched really. Awesome. Okay. We're about to hit one o'clock, so we'll wrap up, but thank you um, to our presenters. That was really, really interesting and has left me with all the warm fuzzies for the rest of the day. Um, so thank you guys. And yeah, we will share all those uh, links and follow-ups um, with you guys over email afterwards. Mm -hmm. And yeah, please feel free to share this recording with anyone um, who, I don't know, you hear lots of things where people maybe aren't sure about fair trade. So please send this on to them to get them on board and share the good message. Um, anything from you guys before we close off? I want to say thanks to everyone for coming along in your lunch break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and thanks for your time, everyone. Good to see lots of good, happy faces out there. The faces I can see. <laughs> yeah, great. Have a great Thanks, rest everybody. of the day. You guys too. Thanks so much. Kaki mm. to everybody.